Well, good afternoon and thanks very much. Uh, my name is Captain Jacob Choi. I'm an Army captain, a mathematician, and a former secondary school teacher as well. Uh, today we're talking about coding for combat. And uh, before we go on, I'd like to encourage you to participate with this discussion uh, by the Twitter handle below on the bottom left. What I'll also try and do is, if we have other relevant Twitter handles, we'll also have them on the bottom left-hand side of the slides as well. So today we'll begin with a problem, and it's an Air Force problem. Uh, Air Force has a niche for buying a lot of good stuff, technical capabilities, without necessarily developing its people. It's not my opinion, by the way. It's uh, from the Chief of Air Force, who said recently that Avalon International Air Show is part of the strategy that our Air Force must place greater emphasis <coughs> on ensuring our people are able to exploit the full potential of our future platforms and systems. This requirement will extend to our leaders becoming adept practitioners of operational art in the information age. So in quotes, whilst we know that technology is a force multiplier, uh, there's also many other factors that are considered force multipliers to give a combatant a significant advantage. So along today's problem, I want to present you a premise. And the premise is that all high school students from here on that we get will have completed some form of digital literacy by the time they complete year 10. And that means for the first time in Australian history, we know that every ab initio training that we, trainee that we get from high school completion uh, is able to be digitally literate. So today we're looking at coding as a force multiplier uh, because it's probably the first time in history that it's got less to do with the traditional fields of communications, intelligence, and engineering, and more to do with an all-core, all-trade, all-service approach. Uh, coding is easily accessible today to school children. And we'll see how it forms the backbone for a lot of military applications because data these days is our most precious commodity. So I want to start our journey today at ENIAC, or the Electronic Numerical <coughs> Integrator and Computer, recognized as the first digital general purpose computer. So it was built in 1943 for the US Army to calculate the trajectories of ballistic rounds. And uh, there's a lot of characters to name in this story. There's the University of Pennsylvania academics who came up with the idea and designed it. There's the Army captain, like myself, uh, who went and got funding for it from the Chief of Ordnance. And then there's the six women programmers who became the first computer programmers, or coders as we know it. So the Army considered the computational logic uh, of the system very laborious, which is how, uh, unfortunately, a woman got it, because a lot of the men went to war. So the women learned the logic gates, they learned the system, they learned how to move the cables and program it. And what normally took 20 hours for a skilled human to work at a desktop calculator uh, actually took these women and its team and the ENIAC less than 30 seconds. So back in 1943, if you could calculate uh, the trajectory of a ballistic round shorter than its flight time, you were 2,000 times faster than alternative methods. So coding or computer programming is a skill of giving instructions to machines to tell them what to do. And you'll see how this is relevant in today's Air Force when we're buying up a lot of machines as well. Uh, we consider f uh, coding as a form of art because you have to visualize what the algorithms will do, uh, but it's traditionally been closely paired with the sciences and technologies. So for the ADF, we have a conundrum for this coding workforce, right? We have a supply and demand problem. Uh, some applicants will look at coding as a barrier, kind of like how some of the math, literacy, medical and physical restraints we have are barriers. But some applicants uh, will be able to see it as an incentive they want to be able to work in a technologically advanced workplace. So some people love the thrill of working with technology, and this is well reflected in the latest Army and Air Force campaigns, as well as the STEM careers page that DFR has put out with Defence Force Recruiting. And this aligns to the overall shift to an Australian workforce that is getting more computerised and more automated. So before we go on, I want to highlight a few caveats and assumptions. Uh, and of course, this is all my opinion, uh, not reflective of my service or trade background. Uh, first, we just don't want any misunderstandings about the context that we're going to have. So I'm not saying that we're going to militarize school kids. That's not good. Uh, but we do know that defense is going to be, hopefully, a profession of choice that they choose when they come to the stage of choosing a career. I'm also not writing about the specialist capabilities of intelligence, engineering, geospatial, and communications. I'm focusing on a more all-core or trade approach. So this is an opportunity to look at how national digital technolo uh, a digital technologies curriculum nationally 
will shape our recruiting pool over the next few decades. So part of the learning content area description for Year 10 Digital Technologies, and if you're further interested, you can see more of the requirements on our one side of your handouts. Well, Year 10 is particularly interesting in this discussion because not only is it the minimum age, uh, minimum standard to join the Defence Force, but for schools, it's also the first area where for literacy itself, just literacy, not digital literacy, uh, we start focusing on handwriting. And we start having a very big emphasis on digital literacy and software. So students have to be able to produce Word documents and think creatively for an audience using uh, office uh, presentations. So what can we expect a digital literacy learning area to look like? So here's an example from ACARA, or the National uh, Curriculum Base, of a satisfactory coding assessment. This is where a year 10 student has been given a game and they've been asked to modify it and add new characters. The student's already capable of sharing this, so working collaboratively, and is also able to design algorithms that can do new things in this game. Uh, here's another example of another assessment where uh, two students have been asked to map out a proposed network uh, for computers, uh, inputs and outputs as well. On the right hand side, the student there has performed to an above satisfactory standard by using uh, common conventions and also implementing a secure firewall as well. So if you looked at the last two slides and you thought, this is foreign, you are definitely right, okay? Because this isn't just about uh, using English in a computerized manner, this is actually a different language set. And for most of us, when we went through school or university, the most that we probably learned about digital technologies was like how to write an email, how to use Hotmail, and then use Office, right? But the difference that you've seen from your own schooling days to what we have now from Year 10 kids is that coding is no longer an option. It's a requirement across the Australian curriculum, and it's our choice to see how we're going to use that in the, in the Defence Force. One note, though, uh, coding is relatively inexpensive these days, right? So this is the Raspberry Pi computer. It's used by a lot of schools. It started in the UK, and it retails for only 50 bucks as well which is a fantastic price for teaching a very basic skill. So before we go on, let's look at what other countries are doing with military, uh, military applications and mil uh, coding. So the US Army has already gone through and uh, consulted with their chief scientist. Uh, they figured out that the SEM pool is one of the best uh, concentrated at the reserve force, right? And they're looking at soldiers and officers to dual hat in their normal job, as well as a soldier or an officer. Uh, military high schools are also proponents for programming as well, especially as new military occupational specialties join cybersecurity teams in the US Army. The US Air Force has altered its traditional flight camps to have traditionally just an aviation mindset to incorporate more STEM activities in addition uh, to the usual uh, showcase of aviation capabilities. And China is competing on a different level through its militarized uh, universities uh, with specialized sciences. And in this case, you're seeing the Bio Island Project run by their Academy of Military Medical Sciences. So at this stage, I also need to clarify some misconceptions about coding. Uh, although English is the lingua franca for coding, uh, there is no statistically different uh, data to confirm that students who don't speak English at home have a disadvantage when it comes to computer programming testing. And that's proven at year six and year 10, thanks to Akara. The only socioeconomic disadvantage that seems to have a statistical dis uh, significance is where students live in a rural area and they perform usually a little poorer than students who live in an urban area. And all these test results, by the way, are from Australia as well. The other thing is coding is no longer an office worker skill. It used to be a very white collar skill uh, and it's increasingly looking like it's a, a blues collar skill. So in 2015, the Commonwealth Government saw this and added a $27 million boost uh, to improve STEM in schools. Uh, some of that including computer programming as well. So nowadays, computer programming isn't required through an undergraduate degree. It usually comes through high school and sometimes a bit of experience as well. The last thing that we want to break as a stigma is it usually is a catchword to sell people to a lifestyle like what you see in the Silicon Valley. Okay? People working with t-shirts or hoodies in an entrepreneurial environment. And that's actually not so true for about 90% of the computer programming force. Like we saw earlier with ENIAC, uh, defense industry, uh, banks, corporations, and medical uh, and tech, uh, educational spheres all see the potential for coding. Uh, and it's a very small skill set that kids can bring to a very large variety of jobs. 
So now that we've covered the supply for computer programmers, let's look at some of the applications we have already in Air Force uh, that are worthy of the work. So what I want to do today is focus on three key areas uh, that are significant to defense interests that will reshape or disrupt uh, the way the Air Force currently thinks and works. Some of these applications work in concert with the new aircraft, but it's important to recognize that coding is more of a way of thinking, uh, just like STEM. So it's not just a, a skill set, it is actually a way of thinking uh, critically. So the first area that we'll look at is augmented reality and artificial intelligence. So normally I'd discuss these topics separately, but they're inherently combined here to achieve the aim of bringing in both technologies. Air Force already uses a form of augmented reality, or AR, in some of its cockpits. Uh, it works in primitive forms with artificial intelligence, but we're not quite there yet, and we'll see why. The key is that augmented reality remains a visualization of what computers can provide us. But we still need to figure out what additional edge it gives us that's different to your desktop, laptop, or tablet computer. So this is where artificial intelligence comes in. Uh, most of us growing up have used, uh, have been exposed to information overload when you see a lot of computer screens. Uh, the computers keep displaying its outputs and currently we as humans are still at using computers in an advisory role while the human operator is still in an executive role. We're not quite there yet and this is no, no vast improvement from the uh, woman who programmed any app, right? We just happen to have smaller machines but we still set the switches and we as the humans are still the executioners. So to help us understand this better, the American Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, uh, just released their latest perspective on artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Launchbury places us somewhere between the second and the third wave of AI. So the second wave of AI is characterized by statistical learning, uh, much like what you see in your cell phones for uh, facial recognition or in self-driving cars as well. Now the flaw with this second wave of AI is that a computer won't see the two pandas that you see on the screen. Uh, the distortion added tells the computer that the second picture on the right uh, is actually a gibbon. All right? And it comes up with that conclusion because of the statistical sets that has been taught through machine learning. So if you ask the computer what's wrong with this picture, it would tell you it's a gibbon because it matches what I've best been taught by the operators as a gibbon. And the third wave of AI needs to provide that context. So the third wave of AI is about contextual adaptation. The computer should be able to tell us why it's a given, because it's got a face, looks like a mammal, has four limbs. And this is called expl Explainable Artificial Intelligence, or XAI. So Dr. Launchboy also identifies three key areas where AI technology is powerful. Uh, the first two are pretty obvious, uh, cyber, scale, uh, cyber attacks at scale and also uh, EM spectrum when it comes to scarcity of uh, available bandwidth. But the third area is where we're most interested in. Uh, Dr. Launchbury sees that autonomous platforms will be able to provide us an extra edge that's scalable, that doesn't have humans on it to provide a reconnaissance, sensing, advice and execution in the air, land and sea domain. So more than 70 years after ENIAC, we're still con conducting a massive amount of computational work as humans rather than computers doing that work. And this is highly, highly relevant as we look at machines that Air Force is bringing in, like the HoloLens. Systems like the HoloLens are going to change the way that we work, or accept information, and then process that. But first, we have to understand how we program these computers. That's why coding is important. The second area of applications is cybersecurity and supercomputing. And I think we need no more con uh, convincing that cybersecurity as an all core or trade skill is important. But what we're seeing is a generic understanding already coming out of places like ADFA, where every officer cadet already has a basic understanding of cybersecurity. Now, you'll see supercomputing on the screen and think, how do we just jump from basic computer programming to supercomputing? And here's the link there's a strong link between a nation's uh, cybersecurity defense. And the talent pool, or the size of that talent pool, of its computer programs. So here's the illustration. Out of the top 500 supercomputers in the world, uh, China and the US are neck for neck in that race. Only one of the top 500 supercomputers is actually Australian. And this is proportionate to the worker base that we have to support that infrastructure for supercomputing in the exascale race. The final area is exciting. And this is uh, one of my areas of specialty as a parachute rigger officer. Uh, aerial delivery has not really improved over the last 50 or 60 years, right? 
but autonomous distribution is going to really uh, be a scalable option for the defense force. We're going to deploy unmanned vehicles uh, to resupply forces and hopefully humanitarian agencies as well. And we already see companies like Rakuten, Amazon and UPS already trialing this. And in the Western world, we're largely constrained by aviation safety regulations as well. The US has already trialed ground transport, like the uh, convoy you see down there. And they learned that from Iraq and Afghanistan when they wanted to reduce the risks of humans on the road. So now instead of a convoy having one driver per truck, you're seeing one driver for the convoy or no driver at all. But if you take away the regulations for the aviation safety part, okay, we know that autonomous distribution can work by aircraft. Zipline works in Rwanda and it has an operator loading a single drone with medical supplies or vaccines and it deploys by a, uh, by a paper parachute uh, that only takes a single human to load. So up to a dozen drones leave a drone port daily and each of them are capable of hitting up to 50 to 100 resupplies a day. We know this can work, so we need Air Force to be able to embrace that. And what this will do is it will free up your, your cargo platforms like the Spartans, Globemaster and Hercules and allow other unmanned assets to conduct that resupply, leaving those other grey assets to conduct personnel movement. This also reduces the risk, maintenance and training of your personnel. So unmanned drones really have a great advantage here. So how do we go about implementing this coding stuff? Well first we need to realise in the ADF that coding isn't just a skill or a science or technology, it's not a system. It's a language and we already have a proficiency system for language recognition in the ADF. If it's a language, we need to find out how we can make it relevant and interesting for the three quarters of school kids who think computer science is awesome, they enjoy it. They have to make that transition from high school to still enjoy it, perhaps in a uniformed capacity. We already pay soldiers, sailors and airmen to maintain their foreign language proficiency, so why don't we do that for computer languages? And we're going to propose a program for programming, and this is largely just uh, copied off the Defence Force School of Languages. So I haven't communicated with them, and I've literally just copied their vision and mission statement. What I've done is switched out the word foreign languages for computer programming. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of copyright there, but it works out really well. <laughs> because if you treat coding like a language, you'll see how many similarities there are with DFSL, and it's already set up within VCDF group to provide us, ADF, a capability as a mission in defense of Australia. There's three uh, key themes in its plan that I'll discuss here on. And these are the three broad themes uh, defined as its purpose or its capability that it brings to defense, the profile, and its engagement. So let's think about this in context of computer programming. Uh, first of all, you see these four goals here. I won't read them out. But the capability that we could provide the ADF is a national defense space full of people who are computer minded. Right? Currently, we don't assess this for people coming into the ADF. We assess their literacy, their numeracy, their psychological skill and their ability to carry a weapon. Why don't we add another layer and ask for, the, for their digital literacy as well? The second area is engagement. And again, I swapped out the blue words for coding or digital literacy. Uh, but we can engage with other areas across defense and uh, across government to facilitate this as well. What I didn't mention about the supercomputers before is that whereas ENIAC was built solely for the Department of Defense or for the US Army, uh, most supercomputers nowadays in the United States, UK and China are actually used for intergovernmental uh, plotting, planning and simulation as well. So we will have a shared use with other government agencies in the, in the uh, interests of Australia. And the last area is professionalism. If we build a capability for coding, we know that there are standards outside that we can match this to. There are external agencies or educational facilities that can assess our people for it. There are competitions that we can go out to, some of them already run by the Australian government, such as GovHack as well. And we can always uh, have a proficiency system where we have governance procedures with a strategic plan. So going along that line, if you look at the nine point scale that we assess people's competencies for foreign languages, this comes across perfectly to computer languages as well. Uh, up in the top there, you see how we assess people's reading, writing, uh, listening and uh, trans translation skills for foreign languages. And this is a great analysis or analogy for where we might put people coming out of year 10, probably at the one or two level, to probably where they have a university recognized course in computer programming. The other thing that we haven't broken down, uh, broken computer programming down into is the many types of languages. And this is why I come back to saying that computer programming is a way of thinking. 
the specific language is easy to learn if you learn another language. And that's why down the bottom, the group languages that we've highlighted there help us to break up the computer languages that we know into specific demand areas that the ADF might choose. We need to also tie this into promotion. And uh, I think this theme has been highlighted early today already. But perhaps we go the way of the U UK Army, where at the rank of captain, if you don't know a second foreign language, you cannot promote to major. Maybe here's a proposition. Instead of just a second foreign language, we give people the option to know a second language or tie in a computer language to be able to promote. And this way, you guarantee that people have either a cultural or technological edge that they can specialize in as they move up the chain. And finally, we'll touch on the theme of competition. We need to push people to compete against themselves in the ADF as well as against other agencies. Coming back to that theme where the profession of choice may be the ADF, uh, we know that school kids want to look at the ADF as a, as a place to be employed and uh, engaged at. One of the things that we can incentivize here is the opportunity to compete and collaborate within the ADF or outside of it as well. And hackathons are a great way to do that. This falls great into uh, Project 16 of Plan Jericho. So uh, the theme there is to develop a contemporary education and training system that meets the needs of the future force as defined by the Air Force Operating Concept 2027. If we're serious about the language of technology, then we need to learn and understand it. And that doesn't need to be an advanced understanding for everyone because we've traditionally seen a very specialized capability for intelligence and communications. But we do need everyone to speak the same language uh, at the minimum level. I want to finish off our presentation today by looking at a paper that uh, Colonel Phil Hogland put across in 2012. It's called Early Separation in the Australian Defence Force. And I found that about 31% of our Abinishino trainees didn't finish their first term of service, and this is across all three services, uh, as well as uh, all ranks as well. Uh, his study breaks it down into different factors, demographics, causation effects. Uh, but what's interesting is that more than half of those who don't complete their first term of service are ab initio trainees that were under the age of 20. So they've done high school in the last five years. There is a strong correlation that people who finish year 12 seem to have a greater odd of completing their first term of service than those who just came in on year 10. So I haven't explored this yet, but if we're able to get a bit of funding and research into this area, I'd like to look at how it correlates between students completing uh, computer programming or STEM skills and what that attributes them, uh, sorry, how that attributes to their actual career in the Defence Force. So we'll come back to the Mobius trip as a summary. Coding is going to be a supply that we're going to get. Right? We're going to get ab initio trainees that have a great base of understanding computer programming from high school coming in, thanks to the federal government's push on innovation. We need to decide as a military whether we accept that as a future capability and how we tie that into all the machines that we have. The F-35 that we're currently buying has 35 million uh, lines of code as a minimum, uh, and people will see that as a barrier. They'll see that as something that a contractor should do, or COG or DST should take care of. But there's no reason why us, as a defense personnel, can't learn coding as a skill to commonly talk across three services, to commonly talk to contractors, and define the projects and products that we have. So the last question we'd like to ask, if we're serious about this, is if we're really innovators. The language of innovation isn't really English, right? It translates across a lot of different nations, nationalities, backgrounds. <laughs> So we're competing with a global workforce here. But if we're really innovators and we're interested in technology as a form of innovation, then we need to understand the language of technology. Thank you. I did promise you that our first presentation after lunch would be stimulating, and I think we, uh, Jacob has certainly fulfilled that and um, taken. Please, I'd like to open the now for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. Mark O'Neill Army Headquarters. Um, and I'm probably going to get you to come and talk to some people I work with too. Uh, the, the literature on military innovation uh, is split on what is military innovation. Uh, there's either incremental improvements to the way you do business or something that actually changes the way that warfare is conducted. I'd like your view on which sort of innovation you're talking about here. Sure. Uh, so for that analogy, thanks for the question. Um, I'd like to look at an analogy where the US Navy a few years ago had to look at the uh, difference it could make, whether it needs to be a blue, green or brown water Navy. 
So that will pose the question of, do we invest in stealthy ships like the DDX, uh, Bellator combat ships? Do we go big and make the next new aircraft carrier a next generational thing? Or do we go small with a lot of ships and in incrementally improve that over time? The short answer to that is yes to both. And unfortunately, that's the uh, constraints that we have as a defense force with limited resources, time, and assets. Uh, I think we're pushed from both sides internally, from our own drive to innovate, as well as externally from what other adversaries have. And you'll notice that the foreign militaries that are put up there, the U US and China, uh, they're really a benchmark of where we could be going, but we don't have the assets to get there as well. So the short answer to that question is yes, we need both. And I don't know how that drive is going to work. But it, it largely relies on that culture that we talked about before as well. Cheers. Thank you, Jacob. That was fascinating. It's following Maria Ivanovich again. I have a question about the uh, idea you put up uh, stemming from the UK military about requiring a second language, be it language or computer language, to promote. Um, so. The uptake of second languages of any kind uh, in Australia is very low, probably because of the tyranny of distance. Thank you, Geoffrey Blaney. Um, and I, I know that because I speak multiple, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm very rare, and I'm guessing you speak multiple too. In an Air Force in which we have serious problems getting people to complete three 1,500-word essays as part of their flight lieutenant PMET, mm -hmm. uh, how do you propose that we make a second language, something that is historically very low on the uptake, um, as a barrier to promotion to 04. We'll just empty the Air Force. Cheers, ma'am. Uh, so the, the question was, how do we, uh, how, how do we normalize the uptake? Uh, I think making it mandatory is something that the UK Army has realized. Okay? And uh, historically, they've been able to do that because they required it of the officers in the, in the pres uh, past days. Back when the UK was a colonial force, people had to know a second language. That's really fallen away. And so for them to reinstate that uh, is nothing new for them. For us, uh, the relevance is that our people will essentially be a product that's easily accessible to other uh, agencies, businesses, uh, cultures as well. And I, I echo what you're saying. Uh, in the Defence Force, less than 10% of people actually declare that they speak a second language. Uh, to be able to mandate that from the top down will cause ruffles everywhere, but that also nullifies the point of proficiency allowances. Uh, it takes away some of those incentives that we've given to very few people to know very specific sets of skills. So the way I'm thinking of it is if you make it mandatory, people have to know that. And at the same time, for a 55,000 person workforce, we're recognized as an innovator that culturally is more aligned to be able to speak languages of our neighbors and our partners. So this will be hugely helpful for things like uh, APEX exercises. Uh, but we know that there's a big skill loss for both computer languages and foreign languages from what kids are taught at high school to what they eventually do in their job in the ADA. Hi, Jacob. Chris McGuinness. That was um, really fascinating. Um, I guess my question is you kind of posed a model whereby defence could manage coding as a language. Uh, I have uh, no, no problems with that. I, I guess I would observe that um, when defence tries to instruct and manage particular things that the commercial or civilian sector also does, it tends to fall behind the commercial and civilian sectors quite quickly. So medicine's mm. one of them. Um, language is, is another. Um, if defence tries to wrap its bureaucracy around something like coding, uh, I would contend that we'll be, uh, and I have an arts degree, so I'm going to get this wrong, um, we'll be talking C++ when you know the, the coding language has moved on to several generations later. So how do you overcome that problem? Uh, short answer, I don't know. Uh, and I, I totally agree with your point. So. Um, I know that we need coding, right? And that's what we're trying to explain today. We need coding, we've got to implement it somehow. There is an existing framework for implementing a language. That's a framework I've worked off. I haven't done any further analysis, haven't contacted uh, Defence Force School of Languages, but from my background as both a mathematician and a teacher, and then coming into the Army as an officer, um, I know where that push would come from, and you're totally right in saying that we would be outdated. But the specific language, as I said before, isn't what we're aiming for. It's the critical thinking component that uh, helps us as humans be able to interpret uh, and also communicate with other humans what we want computers to do. So talking to machines isn't going to be everyone's profession. Uh, 
Uh, most of us will consume them, much like the way that you and I just use Office or Windows. But we need a certain niche of people that need to be deployable, need to be in theater, need to be in a command post or on a, on a command ship. They need to be able to have the skills to identify, talk and troubleshoot uh, some of the problems that we'll face. One of the things brought up earlier today was what happens when we lose GPS, we lose comms, what happens when malware comes in. Uh, if you've read Ghost Fleet as well, what happens when a virus comes in and it's from one of our own. Uh, we are the greatest weakness, uh, the human operators, and so we also need to be our greatest strength. And in that regard, it's, it'll be a hard push, but it's a gap that's there, and if it's a gap left unattended, uh, it'll be much like the gaps of, uh, previous, of the past that we've seen. So Stuxnet is a great example, where a lot of people didn't understand in the military what Stuxnet was, or what it could do. Uh, they may have had it on their phones at the same time. Thanks, Jacob. A very interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. Wing Commander David Fredericks from the Capability and Technology Management College. Um, we have just recently updated our syllabus and our curriculum we're teaching. We're actually bringing in more coding. We teach people of the rank uh, 04 through 03s to 05s. And one of the things we're trying to do, and I'll probably contend, is that there's a missing element here. It's fine to teach people the coding. We also need to teach people how to manage the coding the coders. So at our college we're actually trying to teach people enough so they understand what it's about but then so they can utilize that well. And I think we have to have the complementary skill. It's fine for us to be teaching people coding but we need those people above who can manage it and utilize it to turn that into a capability. Okay? So that's uh, just a comment I would make about your proposal. Cheers. Thanks sir. That's a great point by the way. So um, one of the areas that we're looking at past coding so th this paper is just looking at coding as a basic skill coming from year 10. Uh, but Sarah's definitely right. There's a lot of applications of coding that other organizations or businesses have already implemented. Uh, one of these jobs is data science, which didn't exist when I went through for my math training about 10 years ago. So back in my day, uh, I did a math degree, and it was coding is optional. Nowadays, you're stupid if you go through a math degree and you don't know how to code. Because the output of that is that it's different to uh, statistics or business intelligence. You need to couple uh, your coding with an applicable skill uh, to make a, uh, a reference point, but also um, viable in the defense force. Cheers. Thanks, uh, Peter Hunter from Defense Science. My, my question's remarkably similar to your point, actually, and I liked your uh, quite elegant point just before about um, critical thinking being sort of the, the key underpinning skill. Um, that perhaps there's there's merit in broadening the, the uh, where the need is. Of course, there's, there's this dire need for coding in STEM schools. Everybody's crying out for it, and we're going to die on the side of death if we don't have lots of STEM people and all that sort of stuff. But linking back to that that great point and the critical thinking piece, is it possible that we're harming ourselves by limiting the critical thinking equals STEM equals coding? Um, if, if you look at the kinds of arts and skills that need to go into, say, for example, cyber warfare team. If you only had coders, you wouldn't get very far. You need a whole bunch of analysts. You need, you know, intel people. You need all this kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering. I, I like your elegant point about critical thinking. Is it is it worth broadening your very excellent um, uh, analogy of using the ADF language skills to even broader skill sets? That's a great question, and uh, I cut out a few slides due to time uh, for an ana analogy to this. So the analogy is weapons, all right? And I know every, most people here know about how we employ weapons. Uh, but the basic weapon standard across the, uh, the ADF is an EF-88 or an F-88, right? So everyone knows how to use an hostile rifle. You're all expected to score LF-2 and that, that's the basic standard. That's what we're trying to talk about today is that common standard across that we can expect translating from year 10 straight into the ADF. So we don't lose that skill when people join from the high school, high school standard. And at the same time, we make ourselves relevant to people choosing a workforce. Where it gets specific is those skills like we've talked about with data science, BI, cybersecurity, intelligence, communications, geospatial. That's kind of like the M4 end of it, right? The high-end war fighting. So most people in the Defense Force know how to use, oh, so everyone knows how to use an F-88. Most people know, you know how to use a light support weapon. Officers know how to use a pistol. And then at your very high end, your carbines, uh, your grenades, flashbangs, they're all used by the Special Forces. So if you take that analogy to be used for, for weapons in place of languages and computer languages, we're essentially building that kind of tiered approach uh, in a defense sense, in a, in a physical layout, we call it defense in depth. For languages, we'd call it specialist skills at the center and generalist skills on the outside. 